Welcome to a brand new life, to a brand new day, all the way from the wastelands of California. My name in fact is Michael Deacon, and I am a mere figment of your imagination. Joining me tonight is the one and only Walter Bosley. He has an impressive background in U.S. national security spanning two decades. Walter has since become a renowned publisher for nearly as long. Known for his captivating nonfiction works, he has explored a wide range of intriguing subjects, from the esoteric engineering secrets of Disneyland to occult serial murders, MK Ultra, Lost Cities in South America, and Breakaway Civilizations. Once again, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing us into your hearts and into your minds. Here we are again on a night like this. What's going on, boys? Good evening to all of you out there, those of you in the chat room right now, and of course those of you who will listen later on on the replay on the podcast rendition of this program. Remember, we do have the podcast out there. Just search the Michael Deacon program, and boom, there we are. Now, let's get down to brass taxes and bring in Mr. Walter Bosley. Sounds good. Ah, yes, and of course you are a um, fellow Californian like myself, which is always fun. Yes, oh boy, especially these days, right? Oh, of course. It's a great time. Um, you know, I do love mm. it out here, even though a lot of people, you know, they shit on California, but those are usually people that don't live here. Right, yeah, and um, I've recently spent a little bit of time in a couple of the other states that, um, <gasps> you know, people that are leaving yeah. praise, and I have not been impressed with, uh, <laughs> you know, my experience right. there, and, you know, I'm a native here, I don't know if you are, I was born in San Diego, and, you know, this is pretty much my home state, and yeah. even though that it's in the worst condition that it's been in in my entire life, I, you know, it's, it's, I can't think of another state that, you know, um, that is is perfect in itself right and, you know i haven't i haven't quite left yet <laughs> so and uh walter by I'm the way still, i'm hanging in there you're hanging you know? in there that's good and uh by the way walter i'm actually born and raised in el centro california way down in the desert oh, okay. way down south yes but uh, san yeah. diego also my old stomping grounds as well so yeah. okay. i know the city quite well yep yep so you you're another native commiserating with us natives that still we still like our home state even though you know we wish they'd fix some things <laughs> absolutely yeah so regardless you know welcome to the program it's always a honor and pleasure to speak to someone like yourself mr walter bosley and you know even saying the name walter makes me think of saying or calling you rather walt like uh Br in breaking bad oh well no you know what's interesting is um i've only ever had two people um call me the short version my dad and one of my sisters um so it uh but hey whatever you're whatever you're comfortable with yeah you know i kind of feel like calling you walt so i might just do that if you don't mind sure go ahead i like it actually but regardless once again thank you so much for being a part of the program you know i've been meaning to bring you in here for 
for a couple of years now. Holy shit. But I'm glad you're here <laughs> and you have such an interesting background. I thought we could sort of talk about that. And of course, you know, I do want to ask you about your old man as well. And he had quite the experience too. Yes. Yes. He oh, did. shit. Um, yeah. And, and, and uh, when I finally dove into it and did my own research and investigation, it, it became even more, you know, potentially wild and interesting. Oh, absolutely. So, um, Walter, let's start from the top here. And can you tell us a little bit about your background? Well, I spent 20 years in the U.S. national security community. I split that time up between multiple agencies, uh, primarily the FBI and the U.S. Air Force, specifically the legendary Air Force OSI. Um, I spent my entire active duty service as a special agent with OSI. And then I went into counterterrorism um, with a different organization and uh, wrapped up the uh, 20 years doing um, security background investigations on uh, U.S. government personnel who either needed their security clearances renewed or they were applicants and needed to be um, cleared to receive a security clearance. And, um, you know, by the time I finished doing that for about a year and a half, um, you know, I had done those 20 years and I decided to uh, walk away from it all and and pursue my publishing interests, which um, I had founded my publishing label in 2002 while I was working around the world in the counterterrorism job. And um, uh, since I left the prior career, I've gosh, I've uh, written, I think. 14 nonfiction books and seven or eight novels and published other authors and uh, did a magazine, um, a, a digital magazine for a year and a half and, um, you know, done cool stuff like be on some TV shows. And, and I've, of course, been doing my YouTube channel for a while. So um, I've been doing the publishing for now as as long as I was doing the national security work. So right. I've, I've Kind of had two careers already. That's right. You uh, had basically two careers, like you said. And uh, what was more exciting for you, um, working for the FBI or, uh, you know, writing books here? Oh, boy. Um, it's two different kinds of excitement. Two different worlds, but, you know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it has each has their own thrills. And uh, particularly by the time I got into the counterterrorism work, I was working all over the world that included... Um, I did uh, some time in Iraq in 2003. Oh. I did multiple uh, gigs in Afghanistan. This was, of course, during the, you know, the early years of the war stuff. And, and um, there were some, some, uh, you know, some some risky moments there. Oh, yeah, so you calls okay in okay. Those places. But um, <clears throat> I love travel. I, I really do. And so that was, you know, even if I had to go to some not so wonderful places. It was worth it because, hey, I got to see a corner of the world that I wouldn't uh, have seen otherwise. That's right. And you live to tell the tale. Mm, yes. I uh, knew some people that didn't make it back um, um, those few years, actually. Yeah, I was I was among the fortunate who, um, you know, was able to come back and, and you know, do what I wanted to do. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I don't want to be that guy, but of course, you know, thank you for serving. You know, it's not an easy thing. Oh, sure. Sure. Well, there's a whole bunch of people out there that, you know, have yeah. done it and have done and given a heck of a lot more than I have. But uh, thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, going into that, was that maybe an influence of the old man? No, not so much uh, my dad as an uncle of mine. Ah, the my uncle. brothers. Um, yeah, he was my okay. mentor, my professional mentor. He got a hold of me, um, started, uh, you could say, recruiting me. Um, mm, yes. Shortly after I got out of college. And he, when he retired in 2000, um, he retired with, uh, I think it was 44 years in the U.S. intelligence community. Ooh. He had started out in the Army, 101st Airborne and Special Ops and stuff. And um, it was really him that... Uh, was my biggest influence in choosing that path when i was in high school and college i you know my big dream from the time i was in junior high was uh, to be a movie director i have lo loved film all my life and i started making super eight movies um as my generation you know did uh 
in the, the late seventies going into the early eighties. And then I jumped over to the writing thing once I got into college, but th that was my uh, big thing. That was your thing. But yeah. uh, funny thing was I always liked James Bond movies. I, I, I just turned on to James Bond movies. So when my uncle came around, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. And said, Hey kid, you know, Hey young man, would you like to really be to do that James Bond stuff? I couldn't resist. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Very awesome. And again, from my understanding, your father had quite the experience. Compliments of the U.S. Air Force, nonetheless. Yes. You know, yes, I've absolutely. heard of things like this, this very thing that your old man experienced. And it's always been something that has both fascinated me and scared the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. Yes, a lot of uh, crazy things go down. Yeah, it. Um, he was in the Air Force um, at the time at a very very interesting time specifically when the air force was turned on to mk ultra by the cia back in the uh, early 50s um cia the cia was uh, instructing um u.s military personnel um, on you know this thing that they were calling mk ultra and you know the 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 Navy and the Army found it interesting enough to have their people, you know, initially go through, you know, the training. But we we learned from the historical record, from you know, the books written about it. People have looked into this. We learned that the U.S. Air Force, in particular, really took a shine to MK Ultra, and um, they started their own independent um, research and program into MK Ultra. Now, here's what's interesting. In 1973, 74, I think it was, um, when the church committee kind of uh, raked the CIA over the coals in public hearings, they had to come clean. The CIA had to come clean about some of the nefarious, darker activities um, that fell under their MK Ultra research and application. Well, here's the interesting thing. The U.S. Air Force to this day has never had to come clean about what they've been doing with MK Ultra since the mid to late 1950s. Now, where my dad comes in, he went into the Air Force in 1955, and he was a physiological training specialist. What does that mean? That means uh, he would run pilots through altitude chambers. Um, he and the guys, you know, that did his specialty, they would do the ground testing for um, the pressure suits. Okay, which was, you know, a, a major central part, of course, of uh, early life support systems, right, at high altitude. And, and it was originally intended for space travel. Okay, the high altitude technology for bomber crews and Cold War era, you know, recon aircraft and stuff like that. People don't realize it, but that was a side product of the U.S. Army, then U.S. Air Force pursuit of putting man in space. Putting us in space was their primary goal, get this, dating back to before World War II. And Operation Paperclip, right. a lot of people think, well, that was all about the bomb, and that was all about Warner Von Braun and the rockets. No, no, no. The, uh, the guys in the U.S. Army Air Corps, they wanted to get the German space scientists, okay? So it's called aviation medicine. OK, all this life support falls under aviation medicine. So we got their German aviation medicine specialists. OK, and our aviation medicine specialists, you know, teamed up with them and were in pursuit of putting man in space. Now, all of this, um, you know, again, falls under aviation medicine, along with U.S. Air Force psychiatric division of their aerospace medicine section. OK, and it was the Air Force psychiatrists that took the MK Ultra program under wing, all right? And because for obvious reason, it, it was psychiatrists who created and developed MK Ultra and applied it. So my dad falling under aviation medicine, being involved with life support systems and pressure suit testing and, and the like, keeping crews alive and alert in space or in high altitude and, and eventually in space. Um, this is how he was in the right place at the right time, or some might say the wrong place at the right time, right. Wrong time um, to have been logically exposed to MK Ultra um, testing, technology, method, application, whatever you want to call it. And, and the reason, you know, um, this is significant is that, as you mentioned, you know, I have written a book titled Shimmering Light, in which I, I dove into 
after years, decades, hearing my dad's story about what happened to him in uh, 1958, I finally dove into it. Great book, by involved... the way. Yeah. Pardon? I said great book, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, it involved UFOs and wild stories about underground civilizations. But when I when I finally, eight years after he passed away, I finally, you know, really did a deep dive on his story and his service and such. Uh, what I found was um, MK Ultra was the big giant elephant in the room. And uh, for me, it just made the story all the more fascinating. Um, so it, um, it, it, it really, um, whatever the truth is, because I, you know, I still don't, I can't completely reject the more fantastic uh, parts of his story. That, by the way, you know, until the day he died, he, he really, uh, if, if the story wasn't true that he was telling, he really believed it was true. And this is indicative of, you know, what they call in MK Ultra false narrative. Right, right? a false and implant he, memory, yes. Exactly. Exactly. So that um, that that I tried to that's um, going around the barn as far as giving the short version. Of Damn. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. By the way, you know, hearing that yeah. sort of thing, you know, it really uh, solidifies a lot of things. A lot of things that people have been uh, talking about forever. And of course, you mentioned, um, you know, Project Paperclip, where a lot of these people were relocated. You know, and you know, it kind of makes you think about uh, certain things. You know, like with. Um, Hitler, you know, they said yeah. he died in a bunker, but you know, that's not true. You know, he was in Argentina with all the boys hanging out, having a great time. Uh -huh. And then you also have to think about things like uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Um, yes. It, it kind of makes you, it sort of makes you, uh, you know, conspiratorial. It makes you think, you know, uh, he's probably not dead. It, it, there's, uh, there's no, no reason to assume um, for certain that he is dead. We can't be certain because uh, as we know, there's the obvious, the way that shook out. And, you know, um, it's just, there's, there's more reasons to question it than there are to accept it. There's some fuckery yeah. there. In other words. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. We, like we have to take their word that, he's, <laughs> that, you know, he's dead. Um, and, and our, I mean, are we really going to take the word of, uh, the people that were expected to on this correct I think so. yes and uh, again furthermore i mean there's also sama bin laden right there you go there's another one we have to take their word that oh uh, he's dead and we dumped him in the ocean <laughs> hard to believe hard you know, to believe even 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 lee harvey oswald is buried in texas and you can go to his grave by the way you know what uh, that reminds me what do you think of db cooper i'm not an expert Sure, or, sure, it's okay. Really deeply studied on DB yeah. Cooper, but I I think that there's I'm in that school of thought that there's stuff about the case we don't know. Um, and uh, was he a Fed? You, you think? Know, Do you think he was a Fed? He he could have been. That's the thing. He could have been because the way he did what he did. Yeah. You know that could. I'm saying that could suggest that you know he was um, from from the Fed point of view. What could have understood how things work, you know, in the air and, and how he could have, you know, gotten away with it and planned that out because he would have had the edge of uh, of that kind of information. Absolutely. Now, going back to your father here for a second, do you think he got hit with the LSD at times? It, whether whether it was LSD, um, you know, or or simply the, uh, the what do they call it? The, the psychic driving. Right. Mm. They just hammer away at the the psychic piling or something like that I, I i forget the term i apologize it's a you know it's just like indiana jones father said in the last crusade i wrote it down so i wouldn't have to remember it right, right. um are you gonna but, see the new movie by the way uh well yeah i'm gonna see it only because i've seen all of them you're forced the to watch but, it yes yeah i'm just i'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think my dad is yes, not lsd in particular I think, you know, definitely something that, you know, whatever the Air Force was using in its stead, but um, you combine that with the false narrative. Now, I was told some things when I was still on active duty, mm -hmm. the late 90s, I was told some things by um, a gentleman I won't identify, but he outranked me. And he told me that how he put it was they used hypnosis on my father, on my dad, and... Um, it was keyed to the phases of the moon 
Now, when I jumped into my research and invest personal investigation on this and really took a deep dive into the history of MK Ultra, what you learned pretty quickly was one of the earliest things that was kind of a holy grail for them was a sustainable um, hypnotic uh, suppression of, you know, of the, the pertinent information beneath the false narrative. And they, 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 you know, as far as we know, they weren't able to achieve that. And um, what I was told was they used hypnosis on my dad and they keyed it, as it was said to me, to the phases of the moon. And I thought when I was doing my research on the book years later, I thought that they figured it out. And, and basically um, what what it is they would have done is keyed it to the, say, the full moon so that every so many days every month right yeah when the moon gets full the uh the mechanism in his subconscious would reactivate damn and that and and it would keep the suppression down for you know years and years and i was told that eventually um it would break down and he would start to remember you know more details about what it is they were trying to suppress um so i think the air force at least made some type of breakthrough on this. Um, the way it was put to me was this person knew my dad well, apparently um, said, uh, you notice your dad was very moody. I'm like, oh yeah. He goes, we would call that um, bipolar these days. You know, he was kind of a manic depressive. He, he, I was told that he had baseline level of that and what they did to him made it worse, exacerbated it. And, it, and, and he, he really struggled and he didn't understand why. That, you know, every time each month at the full moon, he would be struggling and, and it would really work on him. And my dad was, you know, really, uh, uh, he, he wasn't brutal or anything, but it was, you know, you walked on eggshells around dad, you know, sure. um, every every few weeks. He was the only guy I knew that could go to Disneyland and not have a good time <laughs> <laughs> if, if it struck him while, you know, on that particular day. And it just the thing, his patterns, his emotional patterns, behavior patterns um, and, and the things he told me, his background in the Air Force. And then what I was told, what I learned as an OSI agent about, you know, what was available to me as an agent that our psychiatrist could offer us um, hypnosis being one of the services, as I recall, we were briefed on. And all of this fit together to um, pretty much um, short of having a document, you know, that says, Yes, you're right. Here's the record of this being done to him. Short of having documentary evidence, I'm I'm convinced that um, he was subjected to uh, MK Ultra um, to suppress something. Something now, that like, happened, yeah. Yeah, either something as wild and fantastic as the story he insisted was true, or something that was during the Cold War considered so vital that we just couldn't let it out. So the fantastical tale that he believed was true and would tell would have been the false narrative. Either way, something extraordinary happened to my dad for better or worse, maybe both. Yeah, I think he definitely experienced something. That's why uh, he was going through all these sort of things. And of course, MK Ultra during, during that program, you know, of course, like you just mentioned, hypnosis, but also sensory deprivation and isolation and sure, you know, verbal abuse and just all kinds of crazy things. And, of course, LSD and other chemicals, other yeah. awesome things that they used. And, of course, you can thank Nazi Germany for creating this. Um, well, and, and we got it from the Nazi scientists because yeah, the angel know, of death. Operation Paperclip. Because yeah. getting these guys was the very reason for Operation Paperclip, the prime motivator. Not the bomb guys, not the missile guys. It was the aviation uh, scientists, the Luftwaffe sci aviation scientists, and their psychiatrists. Now... Here's an interesting angle, though. Um, back then, it's during the Cold War. I think the brand of MK Ultra application that my dad most likely was subjected to yeah. was not was not the uh, the forced, cruel kind. Mm. I get this. Here's what I think. I think that this was the shiny new toy, and I think they saw a way to keep secrets secret. And they and and I wouldn't be surprised if they told my dad and the other guys that he worked with on this. I wouldn't be surprised if they told him, hey. After you're done working on this ultra secret special project, we're going to do this. We're going to use hypnosis on you to keep it suppressed and you won't ever have to worry about, you know, what you saw talking out of school or anything. Yeah. 
and um, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, I got distracted by a loud noise That's outside. Okay. That um, happens to me all the time. Uh, you won't have to worry about it. And and guys like my dad would have said, "Yeah, I want to be part of the team. You know, count me in." And you know, just being patriotic, not realizing the the detrimental effect that it, it would ultimately have on them. So it's very possible that it was not a sinister thing that was done to them. You know, in some dark lab. Um, it's very possible that it was. Um, you know, something they ac accepted as part of whatever duty they were working on. Right. It could have been in, in many different kinds of forms, and I'm sure um, your dad was not um, as abused, maybe, as some of these other people, and they have, you know, really oh, yeah, well, yeah, bad experiences. Yeah, the CIA was doing some awful, awful things to people, as as we learned through the church committee. Yeah, the CIA was a Nazi creation, from what I recall. Um, That's, uh, the more you look at it, the Seems more like you it. come to uh, that realization. That's what I've learned, basically, that this was basically based entirely on the Nazis. And even to this day, America still has quite the fascination with Nazis. I mean, we kind of are helping them in the Ukraine. Not to be pro-Russia here, but, you know, it is what it is. Oh, um, you're, 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 uh, you're on friendly ground with that. I don't buy the, uh, the... The whole Ukraine thing. I don't either. Um, yeah, I don't see Russia as the bad guys in this at all. Well, to be honest, I don't like either one of them, but that's because I'm American. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, they, they, yeah, they both have their issues, but this particular one, this was spun up by, uh, quite frankly, the U.S. military-industrial complex yeah, the uh, feds. using NATO, and uh, it's just, it's shameful. It really is. It really is. And, you know, going back to the old man for one moment here, if I recall correctly, you know, something happened in Arizona. Yeah. Um, what exactly happened to him there? What were you referring to? There was some oh, sort my of my dad's story. Yeah. Retrieval operation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. We, we jumped tracks. That's back. okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, he had told me that this special thing that he worked on was in Arizona, east of Winslow. And that's about as specific as he got. Now, his story is that a, a, there had been a UFO crash, um, as he was told, very much like something that had happened in 1947 in New Mexico, um, which, remember, he started telling me the story in 1974, um, six years before the first book on Roswell was ever released and uh so at the time you know roswell was not a meme it was a little whispered rumor going around and um but he said his experience was in eastern arizona and um he said that they were told that this craft from another civilization not ours crashed and um the people whose civilization it was from approached you know, our authorities, our military, the Air Force was sent to help retrieve a pilot because they knew their pilot was still alive. And uh, according to my dad's story, he was told that this was an underground civilization of humans that had gone underground thousands of years ago and, and developed their civilization separate from us. And uh, they didn't mean us any harm, but they didn't want anything to do with us. And um, as I was digging into the story, and of course, you know, I, my job was to remain objective, even though this was my father's story. Um, uh, what I found was, is that there were some interesting um, underground facilities in eastern Arizona at the time my dad was in. And uh, as, as near as I can tell, um, he, would, he was probably assigned to a special project at one of these underground facilities. Now, remember, this was, we were still in the first decade, just wrapping up the first decade of the Cold War. They were building underground facilities all over the place. Um, there were missile silos being built, but there were other things being built as well. Kind of like, you know, you've heard of continuity of government to keep, you know, leaders safe so we yeah. keep the country going. They have these facilities where they can live and work and all that. It would have been similar to that because my dad wouldn't have been and wasn't involved with anything to do with missiles or missile silos. Um, but what he was involved with, again, being involved with U.S. Air Force uh, pursuit of manned space travel, um, 
that made it real interesting for me. Why would personnel involved with the pursuit of manned space travel be at an underground facility like this? Well, um, perhaps there was some type of launch facility from underground, some other technology. You know, you, you get into some some pretty wild stuff. Now, a lot of people don't realize when I refer, refer to the U.S. Air Force pursuit of space travel, they don't realize that um, our, our manned space program uh, belonged to the U.S. Air Force before NASA even existed. Okay, the Mercury program, if you've seen the movie or the more recent TV series, The Right Stuff, which is all about the Mercury program, right? Um, uh, that started as a U.S. Air Force program, even by name and the design of the capsule and the suits and everything. Um, it was handed to NASA uh, in, in October of 1958, just weeks after NASA was officially founded and stood up. Okay, NASA didn't exist. The Air Force had done the early development of Mercury and just handed it over to NASA. And NASA took, o took it over as far as the public knew. But never were we told that the Air Force actually ever stopped putting men in space. So, um, you know, I, I had to consider that that's what my dad worked in and around. And, and during the years of the Cold War, well, Americans trying to get into space would have, you know, they would have wanted to keep a, an extremely tight lid on that. Right. Even right. though we knew that the Russians were working towards the same thing. Yeah. It's the, the devil's in the details. It's the details you want to keep secret. You know, because you don't want them to know how far you've, you know, the progress you've made, how far you've achieved that goal, that objective. So this would have been like probably the most classified thing that the Air Force was doing at the time. So from my perspective, um, you know, I was I'm, I'm an Air Force officer, reserve officer, inactive, but I understand how the Air Force works. From my perspective, the Air Force definitely would have seen MK Ultra as a way to apply a, a, a excellent layer of uh, operational security, you know, over these secrets. So um, I find it equally interesting to my dad's version of this civilization underground. And, uh, you know, I find it equally interesting that there was something to do with space, uh, Air Force space operations that would have required this underground facility, you know, um, so, so again, the whole thing, no matter which version you embrace, uh, it's all all the possibilities with my dad's story to me are are very interesting. And um, I still cannot 100 percent dismiss my dad's version. There could be literal truth to that as well. Um, it uh, it's just my my fascination with whatever happened to him, whatever the truth was, hasn't ended. That book is just really the first stage of my um, investigation into it. Absolutely. Well, he definitely encountered something. Um, th that's a fact. Something happened to him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Something happened to him. Um, it, it, you know, whether it was some type of, you know, uh, uh, just some type of accident that happened, you know, and people got hurt. Or, or whether it was what he said it was, encountering these underground human beings and, um, you know, the guy he was with being killed by their weapon of defense. It kind of reminds they, that that sort of reminds me of the account of Phil Schneider. Yeah. Um, the, and there's what's interesting about the Phil Schneider account. I personally am convinced that uh, poor Phil Schneider was I don't think he was telling the truth. Well, he might have um, been a little crazy. I, yeah. Yeah, I think he was lifting things he had heard from, you know, because even parts of my dad's story, this 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 is why you have to consider that it was a false narrative laid in my dad's subconscious. And that is, you know, parts of his story sound like other things that had been told prior, you know, in years prior. And it could have been something that was used, you know, to enhance the false narrative. See, and, well, yeah. and Phil Schneider, yes. uh, you know, if he was exposed to MKUltra, for example, the same the same basic idea could have been applied to him as a false narrative. Or I hate to say it, this is the more cynical view that, you know, when he decided to go on the circuit talking about this, claiming it was true, he might have just lifted, you know, this idea from from other sources, sources prior yeah. to himself. Um, but to, to me, even though right now 
right now, boy, the FBI is the most questionable they've ever been. You know, think about that. Um, I, I'm what I've seen of the FBI report on the Phil Schneider thing. It looks convincing to me. I, I do think he committed suicide. Um, and uh, it's just tragic. You know? Right. And there are deep underground uh, bases, though, around the, sure. uh, the United States. Oh, yeah. Definitely. I uh, just, you know, the, so that is for sure a fact. And, you know, going back to um, what I was going to ask you here in terms of, um, you know, people making all, all, all kinds of uh, outrageous claims. I mean, a couple of years back, you had uh, someone like Robert David Steele, who was a CIA officer himself. And, yeah. you know, he was going around saying that there was uh, that there was uh, human slaves on Mars yeah. being trafficked, if you recall. Well, yeah. Um, Steele has zero credibility with me. Um, I had issues with that guy and his claims. And, you know, here, here's what I say. Me too. I'm not saying yeah. that he, he didn't ever work for the CIA, but I, I remind people that um, there is a reason why organizations like Army CID, which is Criminal Investigation Division, um, Air Force OSI, and, you know, the Navy equivalent, you know, NCIS, there's a reason these organizations exist within the military. And that's because, quite frankly, there unfortunately are unscrupulous a-holes in the military. And, and to take it wider, there are unscrupulous a-holes in our intelligence community. And even though somebody has worked for an intelligence agency, you know, it doesn't mean that, you know, after they get out, they're telling the truth or right. they're somebody to admire, respect. And I personally found Robert David Steele to be somebody who I, I could not respect. You could say and he's an asshole if you want here on this program. You he's know. an asshole. There you he go. He's an asshole. Um, he was very crude um, and uh, to, to people that, um, y you know, to women. And, and it, it, it just I, I just I didn't believe the guy's crap that he uh you know, put out there and, and I really didn't care for his uh, personality. But then again, people say, you know, they don't like the, 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 the they say my stuff's crap, too. So you got to decide for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah, he didn't have such a great personality behind the scenes. I mean, the guy tried to make me wear a suit when I interviewed him. And I thought, yeah, that's laughable. <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not going to wear a suit. And he also wanted an essay. Jesus. Yes, he's one of those. Yeah, I you know I have to wonder what he really did. If if he truly worked for the agency, I have to wonder what he really did. You know, there's people who work for the agency, and um, you know, then there's people who work for the agency. Yeah, and I had the uh, the good fortune of um, you know, in in that in that kind of community, in that community, you want the field job, okay? You want the field job where you're away from the office weenies. And, right. um, you know, you certainly, you know, when you do that, you're not working with the people who um, can say, you know, or walking around with, you know, uh, their business cards showing that they work for the agency. You know, certainly, you know, you, you actually when you work in the field and you're doing operational work, you know, what they tell you, you know, is uh, you're, you're not to be anywhere near headquarters or any official buildings, that kind of thing. And what I have found, the reason I bring that up is what I have found is. When you get people down the road that are trying to uh, cash in on uh, their careers or to the extent that what they had, um, they very often end up, if they really did work for the organization they're claiming they did, they very often were some kind of office weenie or, it, you know, they, they didn't do operational work at all. But the veneer of the mystique about mm. the organization that they work for, they, they can really pull the wool over the eyes of a lot of people. Um, you know, I've always, when people misidentify what I did, mis you know, they, they, they describe it inaccurately, I'll correct them, you know, even in, uh, you know, politely, I'll say, oh, no, I wasn't that, I was this over here, which is, you know, cool enough for me. Sure. But um, I, I like to be really honest about that because, you know, in our community, we got people that come along that aren't – they'll let people think things that aren't true, right, to self-aggrandize. And I, I got news for you. Of the real people that have been in the community, the national security community, and have worked operationally, um, that don't set well. You know, um, honesty. You can't talk all sorts of operational details and share classified. But you know what? You can still be honest to a T about what you were and what you weren't. And I, I believe in being honest about all of it. You know, you, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to say, no, I wasn't that, but yeah. I was this over here. 
well, that's that's a great way to be in this world. And, you know, I stopped bringing him on after a few uh, DOD folks started uh, emailing me. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, okay, I see. I see now. And, you know, I did question him about some of some of the sources he was getting on this whole sex trafficking on Mars. And he mentioned <laughs> Simon Parks. Oh, I thought, that was Simon Lord, Parks was his, uh, one of his sources. Yeah. Yes, I, I told him, I said, uh, Robert, that's a really questionable source. And he got so angry at me, you know, he got so bent out of shape. And uh, yes, this is a gentleman who um, was claimed to have uh, intercourse with a uh, cat, with a, ca a cat queen, as he called her. Oh, for crying out loud. Yeah, yeah he birthed multiple uh, children with her. <laughs> And you know what gets me is <laughs> how long people claiming this kind of crap get away with that and are taken seriously by the number of people that they are in, in our community. Oh, you'd be surprised, you know, yeah. It, it's amazing what people want to believe. Yeah, they believe some really far out, um, you know, some far out shit there. Um, and furthermore, I got to ask you, what, what comes to mind when you hear something like the Galactic Federation of Light? <laughs> um uh, somebody's watching, uh, uh, doing a little too much fan fiction of Star Trek, first of all, mm. and um, and not the good original. Trek. We're talking like next generation <laughs> and after crap. Uh, um, yeah, that's a hard I, one for I, me to swallow. Yes, that's a very hard yeah, one and, for me. And when you think of the boobs that were behind that, oh my God, it, it's just a it's a clown show. And what really bugs me is there was legitimate what we call SSP research, you recall, yeah. going on up until about 2015. And what I mean by legitimate, I mean there were serious researchers who were making headway in uncovering the evidence that, yeah, the U.S. has had uh, a classified manned space program for decades, okay? Um, but, but much more, uh, you know, this uh, much more practical, realistic um you know, a, approach to it. Well, it it appears that um, maybe they were getting a little too close to the truth because by 2015, that's when um, you know the, the 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 king of all those idiots emerged and was pushed on us, and then others followed. These alleged super commandos jumping through time and space, oh, yes. you know, fighting bugs on mars and the moon for a couple of decades and are you referring to uh there. are you referring to Corey good we like names I'm, here yeah i i am referring to Corey good there we go and, and um david wilcock oh joining boy in with him and and the people that pushed it you know shame on them too yeah there's um, a lot that did it it's it's sad because a lot of them refer to these guys in their books as a credible source oh yeah and and they and and they'll they'll with time they're beginning to pay for it and they'll fade away as as fools for doing that. But here's what I think. I think that Good and those guys were unwitting, believe me, unwitting, useful idiots to the military industrial complex and intel community who didn't like the legitimate progress that the legitimate SSP investigators were making in uncovering this. So I think they used whatever influence they had with the big media outlets in our community and others to shift the spotlight and keep it on these wacko SSP, ridiculous time-jumping space commando guys, because what it effectively did starting in 2015 was it derailed the more legitimate SSP research. And for, you know, for a good three to four years, whenever SSP stuff was brought up, you were hearing all this BS about this Galactic Federation Blue Avian nonsense. And there were just enough people in the community that embraced that and wanted to hear that, that it de totally derailed, like I said, legitimate SSP research. And there were never any more legitimate SSP conferences. Um, it, and it, the legitimate conversation disappeared. And um, so... The Corey Goods and the uh, Randy Kramers Ooh, yes. and, you know, the David, Wil they uh, they served their purpose. And these stories have been around for uh, even longer than these folks are talking about it. Oh, of course. And of course, they stole, you know, yeah. just like, you know, J.K. Rowling, you know, stole from J.R. Tolkien and, and Neil Gaiman and and, uh, and uh, Narnia and, and all sorts of other sources without ever admitting it to this day. Um, 
you know, Good and Wilcock and Kramer and all these boobs, these lying <laughs> fools, they did the same thing. They yeah. stole from others. Yeah, they lifted lots of material. Um, and I got to be honest, you know, I, I do love a good story. I'm not going to lie to anybody out there. But everybody does. Some of these yeah. things, though, I can't fully believe, obviously, because they're just too sensational, too extraordinary um, that make me, you know, I have a, such a hard time believing that sort of shit. But, you know, there's people like Gary McKinnon who, you know, I've talked to briefly, not on this program, but I talked to him a little bit. And I, I'm sure you're familiar with Gary McKinnon, correct? Oh, sure. Yeah. What well, do you yeah. what yeah. do you make of him though? What what do you make of that story about him downloading these files or trying to download the files he never could because he's on a fifty K uh fifty six K dial up modem, but he <laughs> saw you know, he saw these uh a UFO and he sort of um uh he described it in a way that um basically those are the same things we're seeing today. Well, and here's what here's what I think with, with Gary McKinnon was um, you know, the reason, you know, that uh, he got in the trouble he did was because what he found and exposed was real stuff that obviously, you know, the U.S. military industrial complex did not want exposed under any circumstances. Now, as far as deciphering exactly what it was he found, um, that's a little more difficult to right. do because none of us, um, <clears throat> none of us uh, are, are privy to the context in which what he found was uh, was created or documented. So uh, whether he was looking at literal uh, descriptions of things or, you know, more figurative or within a different context than one might take it, uh, you know, we, we, we can't, from, from, you know, his position being outsiders, we can't say for sure what we can say for sure was that he found something yeah. that uh, they didn't want out, and it's looking, as you said, it's looking like what he found and was going to expose was stuff that we're now beginning to learn about and see. And um, so I think the McKinnon thing, you know, he obviously didn't make this stuff up. Um, I think some people have interpreted it much more wild than the actuality is. But um, interesting, yeah. nonetheless, though, and of course, the Excel, yeah, the Excel spreadsheet that he claimed to have found of uh -huh. non-terrestrial officers, that's always pretty interesting as well. But, well, you know, and, and who the way knows, I though? look at that is mm -hmm. um, what, that was one of the most fascinating bits that, that you know, very often gets wildly exaggerated. But, um, you know, the fact is, you know, if, if the phrase is non-terrestrial officer, yeah. well, uh, that implies at the very least I think um, uh, orbital, you know, space stations. Now it doesn't have to be some ridiculous uh, Star Trek kind of thing. It could be something no, not much different than Skylab was, right? Right. It, it yeah. could just be some type of rotating permanent presence of U.S. military personnel in orbit. Okay, a rotating presence. Could have been. Yeah. That is classified. Um, then, and while you're in that service, you're a non-terrestrial officer, right? right, right. Our personnel, that's, these are the guys that are up on the station. Okay. But it could mean, I think it could also include moon stations, lunar mm. stations. Cause we know, right. That they were pursuing the design of these things and, and the engineering uh, path of these things dating back to the fifties of, of having a station on the moon. And again, yep. nothing over spectacular. You know, we're talking little, uh, you know, cylindrical things, right, that are very basic. Um, but still, um, it, that could mean either an orbital or lunar presence. That's what non-terrestrial officer could mean. So that's pretty cool. It is. It's pretty cool whether or not uh, that's accurate or not. It's still a pretty cool story, and it was worth yeah. him getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you know there's kind of there's there's that but on a side note just really quickly here i was going to say do you think a jonestown was a mk ultra experiment it could have been with um, my boy jim somehow. jones out there looking great in those glasses uh making yeah, all those exactly. people drink exactly. that tea uh, uh, kool-aid see the the thing about that is we know jim jones what had the connection to san francisco right? yeah during during the period that this wild cia stuff was being done 
I, I think at the same time also that they had that apartment that they would spray the aerosol LSD right, right. before a party or, or during a party. Um, we also know that uh, 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 Charles Manson had his connections to the um, uh, a medical clinic in San Francisco that was being run by, I forget the name of the guy, but um, he had his connections to the CIA um, psych program and, you know, uh, on and so forth. So that by the time you get into the 70s, you know, with, with Jim Jones um, and the stuff he was doing, um, it, it, you know, you, you have to, yeah, you, you do have to wonder. And there have people that, you know, that have wondered this and, and they've, you know, kind of done a, a little dive into it and present um, the evidence that uh, that may indeed have been the case. Um, I, you know, um, it's looking more and more like, you know, the Jim Joneses and, and the serial killers and, and much, much more of this stuff might indeed be the 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 wild unintended i hope to god it wasn't intended to any degree but the, at least unintended um bad side effect of um nefarious mk ultra experimentation Ooh. i mean you yes. have a u.s air force connection with ted bundy there you go um, yeah. you, you have other uh, in specifically u.s air force connections to other serial killers over the years, you have the the uh, what looks like the U.S. Navy connection to the whole Zodiac killer issue. And from what I understand, the FBI has recently claimed that they, you know, at least one Zodiac killer suspect that they are allegedly putting their money on. Um, I personally come from the perspective that I think it was more than one person. And I certainly do think that uh, there could have been some MK Ultra connection to that. So, you know, it it's looking like. Um, not only the, the 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 rise in serial killer cases and issues through the 60s, 70s, and 80s um, might have been a, a bad result of MK Ultra mm. games. Uh, yes. We could still have a ticking time bomb um, on our hands, and we don't know how many other serial killers are out there right now. We don't know, um, yeah doing these things and in, in I was going to yeah I was just going to ask you that we haven't really seen uh well at least uh, I think we haven't really seen too many serial killers these days but who knows there probably are and we just don't even know it well it might be too that um here's the thing we might be in a lull between the gener uh, a generational phenomenon with this um it, it uh it, MK Ultra right. it started with you know, targets that they would, and a lot, mostly unwitting, right? The most nefarious stuff was with mostly unwitting targets. And it, if it got out of control and out of hand enough, and it appears it might have, um, you're talking, some of these people were parents, right? They had children. And uh, some of this MK Ultra stuff also leaked out into our society in general through our media, Right through our our popular media, you know, influences. So, uh, I've heard some scholars and researchers say that we might be in a lull, and there might be a generation right now um, in which this sickness, this psychopathy, yeah. is brewing. Wow, is just waiting to boil over, and um, yeah, it's it's potentially um, potentially. Real bad. That's pretty fascinating. And, of course, we mentioned uh, Manson for a second here, Charles Manson. And uh, all I have to say is, you know, the Beach Boys should have listened to his goddamn song. <laughs> right. They should just play the damn song and then everybody would yeah. still be alive. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, oh, boy. The <laughs> things that uh, would have, should have, could have. And, uh, uh, what it would have prevented. But, you know, I'm, I'm again, I'm in that school of thought that... Um, you know, there there were people behind Manson that uh, were wanted certain strings pulled. And, and remember, one of the things we know about Charlie is he would do all that, you know, that that dirty, barefoot, hippie stuff out mm -hmm. there on the ranch with them. But, you know, a lot of people don't know that, um, you know, even his family, you know, the family would talk about. Oh, yeah, Charlie would go away for two or three uh, days at a time. And what he was doing was he was going into L.A. where he'd get a shower and shave. 
and he, you know, had nice clean clothes and he'd go party and, and, you know, and he would comment to the people he was partying with, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he does that dirty hippie thing with, you know, these people cause they're easy to manipulate, you know, and it's easy to, you know, trick young girls into bed with this nonsense. But, um, so there was in that, what do we see? We see an indication of a very cynical, narcissistic, um, you know, manipulator, right. Who himself was being controlled and handled, um, you know, by someone. Um, there's, uh, there, there's a, a young guy named Todd Wood that is doing this incredible uh, bit of research and analysis, and he's going to be um, putting a book together soon. And uh, he talks about the um, MK Ultra connections with, nice. with all of what we're talking about specifically. That, that's and here's the thing: mm-hmm. the, the connections are known when you look close enough. They are known. Um, and uh, so so it should be uh, a, his take should be pretty interesting. He kind of does what I do. He takes the things out there and, um, you know, he stands back, looks at the big picture and sees the connections that maybe the others, you know, don't see. That's usually like my contribution to the to the community is, um, you know, seeing where, OK, I see how, you know, this kind of fits together. And, and that contributes in that it helps you see um, find more evidence you know, um, that's out there that's been overlooked. And so I'm really looking forward to Todd's book um, on these things we're talking about here. Very nice. Yeah, I'll have to make a note of that and uh, look further into this. And um, furthermore, um, there is a movie called Manson Family Vacation. I think you'll like that. <laughs> I got to oh, check that out. Yes, it's a comedy. Oh, boy. Yes, it's about Charles. It's about this guy finding that uh, Charles Manson is his dad. Oh my gosh! You'll like it though. I think you'll you'll. I will check that out. <laughs> you'll dig it. I'm telling you. It came out back in uh, 2015. Uh, Manson Family Vacation. Check it out. You'll you'll dig it. I I know, you like movies, movie. so right up. And I have a dark enough sense of humor. But, uh, there we go. Yeah, me too. Me too. You're in a, you're in the, you're in the right place. Well, excellent. Walt. Now I feel like I'm talking to uh, you know I'm gonna make you um, make some blue meth for me here. Uh oh. No, remember me. I was I was a federal law enforcement guy. I know. I'm I'm you know, joking never, with I've you. Never even, <laughs> I, I've never and and I've I'm such a nerd. I've never even um, smoked a joint to this day. And when I was going to work for the FBI, when I was doing this is fun. Um, when I was uh, going through my interview process, the the agent you know asked me, so, okay, so have you ever done recreation? This is remember this was back in 1987. Uh-huh. You ever done any recreation stuff? I'm like, nope, nope. He goes any not even a joint and i'm like nope and he's looking at me and i'm like seriously i'm a nerd i <laughs> that's funny he must he's and, like well this guy's boring him. you know by by 1987 you know he was just used to you know oh yeah i smoked a little weed but not me you know oh, you've been a uh, straight edge your whole life then i yeah yeah in in, in that regard you know no alcohol terms. nothing <laughs> Uh, no, no, well, yeah, you know, no, <laughs> ah, I see <laughs> nothing, nothing that I'm willing to, no, no substance stories, no alcohol stories. He's a good Christian but, man here, boys and girls. Don't get any idea, any no, ideas I would, here. I, I wouldn't say that. Uh, uh, well, I know, I know. I'm but, just uh, teasing you here. <laughs> uh, I, I just, uh, let, let's say that, um, I'm interested in, in, you know, certain, yes. certain alchemies and, right. and her medical angles on, uh, you know, a common human experience, but I'll leave it at that. I'm with you on that. And going back to UFOs here, before I let you, uh, let you go here, um, have you yourself experienced anything, uh, you know, seen something in the sky, anything of that nature? My first UFO experience, bona fide UFO experience, by the way, I captured it on video and, and have still pictures. Ah. It wasn't until December of 2014. Um, and it, it's, there's a big, I'll have to come on and tell you the whole story oh, so yes. you get the full context, but, uh, it happened the night of the day I was investigating something that is very, um, arcane and hermetic in its nature. And that evening, um, the, the, the object appeared over my house and it was astonishing, absolutely astonishing. I had another witness with me. And again, I, I, I you know, um, grabbed my camera and was able to capture the, the incident on video. And there's so many synchronicities and threads of odd stuff. 
high strangeness connected to it that uh, oh and by the way I, I'm it had nothing to do with anything extraterrestrial but what it is connected to to me is far more fascinating than anything extraterrestrial so it was it was quite quite an experience and that's my one bona fide you know UFO experience but I've had nice. a lot of paranormal experiences I've had I've seen cryptid creatures I've, I've it's it's been it's been very very interesting nice well you know i have to bring you back on we'll talk further more about sure. those um experiences of yours and uh, before we wrap up here you know there's been lots of talk about disclosure disclosure this disclosure that uap this ufo that yeah. um where do you sit here with all this um all these government agencies all these uh -huh. little branches of uh, people they got out there that are drumming yeah. up all this um sort of thing yeah it's a, it's all it's a ruse. They're using it for perception management, to uh, uh, re regarding uh, classified technology. The Tic Tac was merely advanced technology that um, you know. And there's a lot of sources out there you can see that you know will explain this. I'll be glad to come on sometime and talk about it. But sure. Basically, all, you know, disclosure is a carrot. They're always dangling. That someone's always dangling. Um, we're no closer to the disclosure today than, you know, we were, and, and it's just, it's all, it's just all stuff that people, some people in the community just love to hear, and, um, but it's not what they want to believe that it is, um, so. That's where uh, I am right now, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. And I'll be at, at Contact in the Desert, uh, covering the event as, uh, the media. No, oh, we'll have to meet up. I'll be out there hanging out at uh, uh, Clyde Lewis's table. Oh, okay. Hanging well. out with him and um, and uh, Olaf Phillips and the gang. Yeah, I'll go say hi to you then. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll stop on by. And in terms of like, let's say, you know, let's say uh, the government actually just says there's extraterrestrial life out there. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, humanity would really give a shit? I think I think everybody will be excited about it. I think everybody will be fascinated. The only people who will freak out, you know, um, are are just folks that um, you know have been have been led astray in other walks of life. But I think for the most part, you know, humankind's going to go, "Wow, cool! Finally, they admit it. You know, finally, you know, maybe we'll get to meet them." Because I think most people now. Um, you know, accept that it's an inevitability that we're going to meet them and uh, that it's been going on for ages. Very nice. Once again, I do want to thank you for being a part of the program. And um, I would leave you with a final word, anything you want to say, uh, anything you want to plug here, uh, plug your show. Uh, you know, I know you have a YouTube channel. You've been doing that for a while. Uh, yeah. Tell us yeah, about that. Some, some really fascinating conversations going on at the Walter Bosley channel at YouTube. The biggest one right now is Joseph Farrell and I are in an ongoing um, uh, conversation uh, about trans-temporal cosmic warfare. So go to the Walter Bosley channel and check out the live uploads. Go to the live tab and, you know, scroll through there and you'll see some interesting things. Very nice. Once again, thank you so much for being a part of the program. You are a straight shooter, my friend. We'll do it again on the other side. All righty. Thank you. Looking forward to it. And there he goes, boys and girls. That was our guest, Mr. Walter Bosley. And my God, we just scratched the surface here. I want to give a major shout out to all of you out there right now for pressing play. Those of you who catch the replay, as I said in the beginning of this program, if you are hungry for more, please go to patreon.com forward slash Michael Deacon. And yes, we have, I believe, 81, 81 episodes for you, I believe, in the Patreon vault. If you want more, please go to patreon.com forward slash Michael Deacon. That is where gold falls from the skies, I like to say. And boys and girls, I will catch you on the other side. Much respect to all of you out there for pressing play, those of you in America, and of course, those of you outside of America for listening to this program. We appreciate every single one of you. Stay safe no matter where you are on this island earth. My name is Michael Deacon reporting to you from the wastelands of California. And with that said, the world is a mysterious place, and life itself is a mystery. Until next time, good night.